Welcome back. It's 1877. Up to now, Ruskin has been ahead of the public, inspiring and driving them with new moral ideas. And this year, he's the one who's taken by surprise. James Abbott McNeil Whistler, painter of shimmery atmospheres influenced by Japanese prints and landscape painting from France, becomes the great Satan to Ruskin's great guru. Here's a painting Whistler exhibited in a London gallery in 1877, Nocturne in Blue and Gold. The whole show was like this. Here's Nocturne in Black and Gold. Ruskin was appalled. He wrote that Whistler was throwing a pot of paint in the public's face. Whistler sued, and a year later, when the case came up, Ruskin lost. What were the real issues of this fight? Like anyone in England at the time who was serious about art, Whistler was influenced by Ruskin's ideas about the importance of nature and the need to create a new type of art that didn't just repeat old, stale academic conventions. But Whistler had worked in Paris as much as he had worked in London, and he was influenced by the new painters coming up in Paris, the Impressionists. What they did was a kind of concentrated, edited version of nature, very intense. They created impressions of atmospheric effects. Ruskin's idea of nature as a force in human life that fights corruption helped create the climate of opinion that made Impressionism, an art rooted in nature, possible. Impressionism is all about the texture of modern life. New entertainments, new suburban pleasures, nature always seen in the context of crowds milling around, of urban life always going on in the background. And Impressionism's techniques of separating things out, separating out the light and atmosphere from the trees and clouds and crowds, are part of what it feels like to be in that modern life. This version of Impressionism, The Bathers, by Georges Seurat, seems to be full of the ideas that Ruskin is interested in, nature and what's happening to it. You couldn't get a better expression of what Ruskin says is happening, you'd think. But nature for Ruskin is the frame for looking at man's relationship to work, and Impressionism is not about work as Ruskin wants work to be. He would be baffled by a type of art that verges on the edge of being abstract. Colour effects celebrating themselves, drifting back onto objects when they feel like it, drifting off again. It's not art looking at work, but art looking at itself, art about art, which on Ruskin's terms can only be more corruption. Workers having a weekend break from industry. They're going to be back serving it again on Monday and they're going to be doing that for the rest of their lives. Is it celebrating the ephemerality of modern experience or damning the modern world for going wrong? Are the labourers groaning because they're slaves? We don't see any great moral law. Where is the Ruskin-type lesson in how to live? We won't ever know how Ruskin might have tried to convince us that Impressionism is bad instead of good, as he did with the Renaissance, because it was exactly at the time Ruskin declared war on Whistler that his mind declared war on him. Ruskin's attacks of mental illness, which began in Venice when the Whistler trial was about to kick off, when Ruskin was in his late 50s, came and went for the rest of his life. He had 22 years of only intermittent sanity. Sometimes his lectures to audiences of a thousand people or more would be punctuated, at first by a little singing, which the audience was slightly amused by, and then by capering and dancing. The Victorians were too polite to mention out loud what was all too obvious, that the guru and seer that they'd followed so eagerly and sincerely was off his rocker. In fact, he was always cranky in many ways. When he died, he was almost certainly a virgin. He couldn't cope with adult sexuality. In later life, in his writings, he was always going on about the beauty and delightful company of very young girls. Of course, they were perfectly safe with him, 
But all this made him vulnerable. His mighty ideas about art and society challenge complacency. So over the years, people have preferred to gossip about his weakness and forget about his ideas. And they've been aided in this by the fact that he did go mad. He was what we would now call bipolar. He saw devils, he had hallucinations, until finally he spent the last 12 years of his life secluded away in his house in the Lake District in absolute silence. No one who looked after him then knew if there was anything going on in that incredible brain or nothing at all. Ruskin thought nature is the foundation of human morality. Nature fights corruption. It is not the thousands of possible ways in which an artist might perceive nature, but what nature is that's important. But the direction of art that followed on from Impressionism was not nature's truth, but the artist's truth. The artist's self becomes the new nature. This becomes the new tradition. Now it's an old tradition. We look back on it and call it modernism. The big thing about modernism is art rushing to embrace progress. In that atmosphere, an art critic saying, watch out for nature's moral guidance, just doesn't compute. Now we're on the other side of modernism. We are threatened by progress. We're threatened by change. We feel its weird distortions. It's modernism which seems distanced and quaint with its relentless affirmation of the new. While Ruskin saying, watch out that progress doesn't poison us, seems urgent. Ruskin has the gift of sight. He's not just yakking on about the difference between the Gothic and the Renaissance. He's seeing that there are different levels of humanity in different types of approach to art. In art, we see what we are, what we're doing. We see what we've got to do to survive. Ruskin wrote that to see clearly is everything. It's poetry, religion, philosophy. He sees into the future. He sees us, our own sense of dissatisfaction and emptiness, our pursuit of excitement and sensation to make up for it. He says art is the answer. It shows us what it is to be civilised. It connects us to something profound. Not just the buzz of the type of art that changes every five minutes, it's a whole way of thinking, of gaining illumination, in which the past is intertwined with the present. Ruskin mythologized the past in order to build an argument. We are blinded by habit and familiarity. We've learned to live with lies, but we can open our eyes and see. To look at art and see how it works and how it's connected to the world through its forms and metaphors and operations, all this eyes-open activity is to begin to see how one thing is better than another, one thing wrong, one thing right, one healthy, one sick. It's to begin to judge existence, to believe it can be changed, to begin to live as if our souls are worth saving. Our art today isn't necessarily any shallower than the art of Ruskin's day. It's our appreciation of it that's the problem. We've been conditioned to see our art as glamour. We don't know how to look through its surfaces and see what it really is and think for ourselves about it. No one ever asks us to. But the whole point of having art is that it challenges the superficial. Ruskin's great lesson is not that medievalism is the answer, but that awakening consciousness of what's really going on is the answer. You don't have to be an art snob to find that important. You only have to be alive.